Digital electronics is based on the technology of the MOSFET, specifically coming in pairs. And so we're going to talk about the complementary metal oxide semiconductor where you pair up an NFET and a PFET in order to make a fundamental building block device called an inverter, which is the most basic digital device from which all other devices are made. From inverters, you can get NAND gates. From NAND gates, you can get everything. So let's first go through the individual gates, starting with the NFET. So remember, it has a P-type substrate, so it's normally P-type out here, but when the gate voltage is high, you get an inversion layer, and it, then the inversion layer will be N-type, hence it's called an NFET. So you have an N-type inversion layer, and an NFET is on, that is, you have an inversion layer, when the gate voltage is greater than the threshold voltage, and the threshold voltage is positive, and what positive means is greater than the source. So everything is relative to the source voltage. So as long as the uh, gate voltage is higher than the source voltage by the threshold voltage, you develop an inversion layer, in which case you can say the MOSFET is on. And when it's on, the drain source voltage wants to be very small because you're able to push a lot of current through the MOSFET when it's on. And that's where the external circuitry plays an important role because the way we've been looking at things so far, it all, you almost get the impression that the drain source voltage stays large while you're running a bunch of current through the FET. But then if that's the case, you're running a lot of current through the FET. And actually, our goal is not to push current through in digital electronics. The goal is just to set voltages, but to block currents. And so the drain source voltage will actually be very small when the gate is above threshold and you're turned on. When the gate is below threshold, then there's no inversion layer, and current couldn't pass through this thing if it wanted to. And likewise, then, the drain source voltage is easily very large because of the fact that you can't get any current through. You can turn that drain source voltage up as high as you you want to and you know until it burns up. Now, everything's the opposite for the PFET. And I've even drawn it oppositely. I put the source up there, the drain down there, for reasons that have nothing to do with anything right now. But in a few minutes, we'll see why I'm looking at it in reverse. The substrate is N-type. And so when you have uh, the gate voltage applied, you can get a, a P-type inversion layer. But what do you do with the gate voltage relative to the source voltage? For PFET, the threshold voltage is below the source voltage, is negative. And so the, the gate voltage has to be lower than the source voltage by at least the threshold voltage. So the source might be held high. You know, Typically, for PFET, you, you ground the drain and you put the source high. If the source is say at 10 volts and the threshold voltage is one volt, the gate needs to be less than nine volts in order to have an inversion layer. So when the gate is less than threshold, you then could run current through the PFET, and so the voltage across the PFET will be very small. Not zero in either case because of parasitic resistance, but small. We set these up in digital electronics so that you actually don't push current through. And if the PFET is turned off, which is the case when the gate voltage is greater than the threshold voltage, then you cannot get current to go through anyway, and the voltage across the drain source will be large. That's the case for the NFET and the PFET. They have all these opposite things, and I just want to emphasize the meaning of the word on. I'm going to keep using it now. And when a FET is on, current can flow through the channel. The drain source voltage is ideally zero. This is a cutaway view of a complementary pair of MOSFETs. Take a look at it for a minute and see if you can identify where is the PFET, where is the NFET. So do you recognize the PFET is the top half and the NFET is the bottom half? Down here you have P substrate, and so when it goes into inversion, you have an N-type inversion layer. So this is an NFET down here. Now how do we arrange a PFET when we have a P substrate? By putting in this well, that is a, a region of the substrate is doped to be N-type. 
and it's referred to as the N well. So, and then you can uh, have a P type inversion layer. So we have PFET on top and NFET on the bottom. The source for the uh, PFET is attached to the power supply. V sub DD means power supply. The drains are connected together for the two MOSFETs. And there is a metallized terminal then that, that is connecting them and that serves as the output voltage. Then the source of the NFET is grounded. The gates are connected together. They're shorted right together. And a voltage can be applied to them and that's used as the input signal. A voltage is put on the gates and something happens to it at the output and let's think about what that might be. Let's look at an equivalent circuit for this uh, for this cutaway. So you've got the PFET on top and the NFET on the bottom and so here's the PFET with the source going to the power supply, the drains connected together, the place where they're connected together serves as the output voltage, the source of the NFET is grounded, the gates are connected together and Whatever voltage is put on those gates is the input voltage. These are the symbols. And fet, I, I kind of like this symbol where you have a double line here at the gates to remind yourself that there's an oxide capacitance there. I'm not always employed in these symbols. And for the PFET, you also put this little circle here. That indicates it's a PFET. Without it, it's an NFET. So that's the cutaway view, that's the equivalent circuit. Now let me ask you a few questions about what happens in this circuit. Supposing that there is zero voltage at the input, that is, I guess it's grounded, if the input is, is at zero volts. What voltage will you see at the output? So VDD is the power supply voltage, just typically two or three volts. Ground, so we'll call that zero at the, the source for the NFET, and we put zero at the gates. So you have zero at the gate for the NFET. So what happens when you have zero volts at the gate of the NFET? You have the same voltage as the source. You do not have an inversion layer. And so the NFET is off. It couldn't pass current if it wanted to. Let's look at the PFET. When you put zero volts on the gate at the PFET, then it's a much lower voltage than the source. So it's certainly lower than the threshold. If the source voltage is 3 volts and the threshold voltage is, say, 1 volt, you are more than 1 volt less than the source if you have 0 volts here at the gate. And so the PFET is on, and it could easily pass current if it needed to. The way to look at them, then, is that the NFET is a large resistance and the PFET is a small resistance. Think of the voltage divider. You have high voltage at this up here attached to the source of the PFET, zero resistance to this point in between, and then high resistance to ground. What's the voltage at this point in between? The same as the power supply voltage. So if we have zero volts at the input, we have V sub DD volts at the output. Zero volts got turned into a high voltage. Suppose that the input has voltage. And that voltage equals the power supply voltage. So instead of connecting that input to ground, we connect that input to the power supply. Now you have V sub DD at the gate of the NFET. So you have some voltage at the gate of the NFET. In fact, you have high voltage because you probably don't have that much voltage at the drain of the NFET. So the NFET has a large, as it has a good inversion layer. The NFET is on. You put that VDD at the gate of the PFET, now you have the same voltage at the gate of the PFET and the source of the PFET, but in order for a PFET to be on, the gate has to be at least the threshold voltage less than the source. So the PFET is turned off. So the PFET is off, the NFET is on. That means the PFET has high resistance because you couldn't pass current through there if you tried. And so it's like you put a lot of voltage across there, a little, little a very little current. Think of it as a high resistance. And the NFET seems to have very low resistance. Meaning this point right here in between them is very close to ground. Again, per the voltage divider. So you had high voltage going in, V sub DD, and you have zero volts coming out. So this structure, this circuit here, 
turns a high voltage into a low voltage, it turns a low voltage into a high voltage, and that's why it's called an inverter. It inverts your voltage. So that's the basic building block of digital electronics. Current goes through this device from the power supply to the ground. It has a continuous path. But when with one of these MOSFETs always in the off state, that's a block. And so current actually does not flow. Very, very little current flows anyway. It does flow briefly, very briefly, while this a circuit is switching. That is, if you switch uh, input from low to high, from zero to VDD, during that very brief period, the output has to go from VDD to zero, and both of these MOSFETs for some nanoseconds need to both be on as they trade places. And so you do have a little bit of current that goes every time you switch, and that counts. So we, we think about that. But by and large, the MOSFET is a low current device and con therefore consumes very little power. Chapter 7 it devotes a lot of attention to minimizing that current. And we we'll call it the leakage current. <laughs> minimizing that leakage current is a, is a big, big deal in Chapter 7. I'm coming back the next day and adding one more little detail. What if the input voltage were half the power supply voltage? If that's the case, then both gates are at half the power supply voltage. And so the PFETS gate is less than the source voltage by half the power supply voltage, which could be, be a volt or two. And the NFETS gate is greater than the source voltage by half power supply as well, which is one or two volts. So in all likelihood, both of these FETs are above their threshold voltage. Both of these FETs have inversion layers, and therefore probably both of these FETs are on at this point. And that's, that's typically yeah what's going to happen, which means that that's not a very useful voltage if you want to actually have an inverter. Because now what's the voltage at the output? Well, if, the, if both of these FETs are on then, and we have V sub DD going all the way down to the source, then it's half of V sub DD at the output. And so what goes in comes out at half of the voltage. So there, that's not an inverter, that's a through line. So it's worth thinking just a little bit about what the output voltage versus the input voltage might look like then, based on the three points we just rationalized. You know, when the input voltage is zero, the output voltage is the power supply voltage. And when the input voltage is the power supply voltage, the output voltage is zero. And if you're in between, it's going to be in between like this. And it will go like this, something like this. Yeah, at, at low enough input voltages, one of the FETs will be off. And at high enough input voltage, the other FET will be off. But there is going to be an intermediate range where both FETs are going to be on that you need to avoid. So this circuit is really only good for two states. Input voltage equals zero or input voltage equals the power supply voltage. And in which case, then the output voltage is either the power supply voltage or zero. So it's a digital circuit. You got a one or a zero. You're either high or you're low. There are only two possible states. It's not analog. There's no real value to doing anything continuously here. That's why this is the building block for digital electronics. One other thing I, I left out of the previous discussion yesterday is that the output voltage is just a voltage tap point. Typically, the output is capacitively coupled to whatever's next. So you don't actually get current flowing out that way. I realized I didn't clear that up, and now I have, so you can proceed listening to the lecture not thinking that current must be heading out the output, because there's usually capacitance out here blocking it. Let's make a truth table for this circuit. So here we have two rows. One row, we're going to interrogate the circuit when the input voltage is zero and ask what happens throughout it. Then we'll interrogate the circuit when the input voltage is high, when it equals the power supply voltage. And so low and high mean that. Low means zero volts. High means whatever voltage you've got the power supply at. So when you have zero volts at the input, what's the PFET? It's on. What's the NFET? It's off. And so the drain source voltage across the PFET is zero because it's on, and it's high. It's the power supply voltage for the NFET. So what do you see here at the output? Well, you have 
Uh, you go from ground to V sub DD, and then you go from V sub DD to V sub DD. The, the output's at V sub DD. It's high. And if you have high V sub DD at the input, the P FET will be off. The N FET will be on. So the drain source voltage across the P FET will be minus V sub DD. I mean, it, you drop, right? So you go down that. The drain source voltage for the N FET will be zero. And the output voltage at the point in between them, if you go from zero at, at the source of the N FET to zero at the drain of the N FET, you have zero at the output. And that's the truth table. Well, the first and last columns together make for one. But there are a lot of things to talk about with, with uh, CMOS, but the topic I'm going to choose for right now, you have these two MOSFETs. They're on the same substrate. What's to stop current from going directly from one MOSFET to the other MOSFET? Well, essentially nothing, other than the fact that the current has to be pushed through PN junctions all along the way. Well, and that's what makes this really kind of an insidious setup here. See if you can recognize the bipolar structures in this setup. So do you see, uh, for example, this one? An NPN transistor. I go from N drain to a P substrate to this N well. It doesn't have to touch that drain pad. And a PNP uh, structure. I go from the P source to the N well to the P substrate. And it's it's worse actually because because look at look at the, uh, the the collector of the NPN and look at the base of the PNP. They're electrically in the same place, so they're connected together. And then look at the collector of the PNP and the base of the NPN. Likewise, they're in the same place. They're in the P substrate. They're electrically shorted together. So they are an oscillator, right? There's positive feedback between these two transistor, these two PNP structures. It's a, it's a potentially a pretty bad thing, the parasitic NPN structures that you have inside of a CMOS. The phenomenon is called latch up when, when they have a significant role to play. And when they're noticeable, you have this positive feedback, you get a lot of current, and the CMOS can easily be locked into the on state, and so you need to isolate it, because that's really undesirable. That ruins the performance, these three bullet points. So the fourth bullet point here says you've got to fix it. And so you have to isolate these two uh, MOSFETs. And one uh, easy way to do it is exactly what you might be imagining, Build a wall between them. Cut off this electrical continuity between them. And so that's what's done. A trench of silicon dioxide can be put in there. And it doesn't have to be very deep. In fact, it's often called shallow trench isol isolation. As long as you're at a, a recent technology node so that, that uh, structures are small, this trench does not have to be very deep at all. But that's how it's isolated. And so that's one of the, the key issues in CMOS design is isolating all of the MOSFETs from each other so that you don't have parasitic transistors inside the substrate. So what we need to talk about next is switching speed. You want this to work quickly. You want it to go fast. When you have a very fast microprocessor, it's because you have very fast CMOS. And so increasing the switching speed is really important and capacitance and resistance parasitic resistance those things don't help <laughs> keep that switching speed uh, down so we will look into this in our next lecture how do we speed up CMOS and then what we're going to look at in a later chapter is how to break the parasitic current that flows and especially how to make sure that uh, there isn't off state current especially that's a big deal in chapter 7. We'll stop with that and pick up with speed next.